Hello and welcome to True History of the Russian Mafia, part 2. Make yourself comfortable, maybe start playing some non-dialogue heavy video game and put us on the background, or perhaps uh, take us uh, with you on the walk or a driving session. We will talk about organized crime in Brezhnev era USSR. It is often said that uh, a poet in Russia is more than just a poet. Similarly, organized crime in late USSR was more than just gangs of gopniks in the hood or even Italian-style mafia. In many ways, the uh, criminal world became the foundation of burgeoning republics. By researching Soviet criminal waves, you can find the answers to main geopolitical questions of 20th century and partly the nature of Russian and Ukrainian business and politics. But I won't say anything more here, because our YouTube is probably watched by FSB agents. <laughs> Fortunately for me, I will have a full freedom of speech behind a paywall in the full version. All right, let's begin with the general overview of the 70s and Brezhnev's rule in general. Brezhnev and his contemporaries called his reign a period of developed socialism, which supposedly started in 1967. His critics and various dissidents, Gorbachev later on, would name this period an era of stagnation, Epocha Zastoya. I think the truth was in the middle. While it's true that productivity of the workers was decreasing, the petty crimes of Nisuni, people who would steal from their places of work, was going up, the youth gangs were forming in all major cities, a grave realization was permeating the air that it's probably impossible to reach communism, uh, an utopian post-scarcity society devoid of greed and vices being ruled over by some benevolent uh, machine, like in Chile, the cyber scene project. <laughs> it, it was nowhere to be found. Worse yet, the communist-aligned countries started crumbling under the pressure from America. Pinochet toppled Allende in Chile. There was a politically motivated genocide in Indonesia with the indispensable aid of America. One million of Indonesians were murdered because they either were communists or they lived close to communists or shared some of their ideals or for whatever reason. I'm not a fan of the Soviet regime and communism in general, but it's clear that by that time USSR was mainly on the defense and the real monstrous octopus that was consuming the world was America. The 1970s USSR was tinged with a certain romantic melancholy and an increasing sense that all of it is not going to last forever. But it wasn't all doom and gloom. Uh, it's also true that under Brezhnev, an absolute majority of Soviet citizens started living relatively normal lives. Everyone knows of Khrushchevkas, which were not bad. But in the 1970s, a new type of building appeared, Brezhnevka. And those Brezhnevkas were not bad at all. Although there were less of them built overall, they provided a new way of living. All of them were equipped with an elevator. Elevators are comfortable, but are increasing crime rates. And a good portion of those Brezhnevkas had garbage chutes, so you could throw out the trash without the need to leave your home at all taller ceilings, etc. Many point out that there was a deficit of products under Brezhnev, but I think it's not fair because deficit was more or less perpetual throughout the history of USSR. Famines uh, and wartime era were way worse than the mild deficit of the 70s in the so-called era of stagnation. And with the new gray economy up and running under Brezhnev, people had an ability to buy anything they wanted, more or less. The only problem was that gray market stuff was expensive and people's salaries were modest. The average salary being 120 rubles a month, which by official currency conversion, 75 kopecks per dollar equal to around 160 bucks a month. The average Soviet salary of 1974. And I'm using 70s dollars not modern ones, of course. I might do a quite autistic conversion for various food items. How much did they cost in 70s dollars? But first, let's tackle the crime aspect 
of the 70s. Kirill, take it away. Yes, and this era was also when street crime reappeared in a big way again. Since the end of World War II, Soviet authorities had been extremely harsh on all sorts of street crime and uh, cracked down really hard on the gangs and things like that. And like we talked about in the episode before, the emergence of the shadow economy in its more advanced state created a new class of criminals who would prey on the people who ran the shadow economy. And this new type of crime proliferated, and really it created a bunch of downstream effects by creating new sources of crime, new sorts of crime, new ways of doing crime. And the most famous example of this is a very interesting sociological phenomenon, because there is still no single explanation for it. And uh, there are a bunch of different opinions, uh, some more academic, some less academic, but it is um, the thing that came to be known as the Kazan phenomenon, named after the city of Kazan, the capital city of Tatarstan, or the Tatar Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic. From the early 70s on, Kazan had the reputation for having extremely violent streets, young men or even boys forming street gangs and engaging in violent crime. There is, as I said, no single opinion on why this happened in Tatarstan and why it happened so rapidly. We've talked before about this new television show that is very popular right now in Russia, uh, Slovo Patsana. It's exactly about these gangs in Kazan. It is based on a book by the same title. It's translated as The Word of a Boy or The Boy's Word. And it was written by a Tatar journalist, uh, Robert Garaev. He tried to trace why and how this sort of violent crime started appearing. In some ways it wasn't really a new phenomenon as such, because it started out as the usual rivalry you get in big cities that uh, occurred in every big city of the Soviet Union. Namely, culture and social scenes were much more local in the sense that you'd usually hang out with the people who you live next to and you wouldn't really leave your quarter of the city much. And because of this, there were highly localized identities based on where you live. So yeah, you get people heavily identifying with the place where they live. This also is connected to the structure of the Soviet economy, where thousands of people would be working at the same factory and they would be living next to each other in a new living quarter that was built specifically to house the factory workers and then their children would also use this as a sort of common identity and uh, yeah they all live next to each other and uh, as you know wherever you get identities you also get conflict between identities so in a way this happened everywhere Some of our racist listeners might think that, um, well, it's simple. The Kazan phenomenon is uh, explainable by the ethnic question because there are simply too many Tatars. <laughs> I, I was going to get to that because uh, it was quite shocking to the Soviet public because Kazan was a place where there were no ethnic tensions, really. The population, well, I don't have statistics at hand, but it probably was like 50-50, Tatars and Russians. There were no notable ethnic tensions in the city. Kazan was like multicultural, so to speak, for centuries, and there haven't been any problems like since the Middle Ages. <laughs> so um, this was really not a racial thing, as the gangs were all mixed, ethnically mixed. There were both Russians and Tatars. I think ethnic gangs only appeared in the 90s in Kazan, so much later. And at that time, there were still no ethnic tensions at all. And uh, this, these conflicts cannot be reduced to the ethnic component at all, uh, since it was so highly intermixed, it still is. And uh, Kazan is really not a place like, I don't know, the North Caucasus, where, he, where you would get these things that happened, or so the south of Russia, where you'd have like Armenian or Azeri gangs. Um, Kazan is very different from that because Russians and Tatars have been living there side by side for 500 years. It had a reputation as a very kind of peaceful city in that sense. I think uh, Kazan is the only success story, multicultural success story in the world. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where the free segment of our podcast ends. 
free yourself from tedious American monoculture and subscribe to Russians with Attitude. Thank you.